Welcome to Theory of Pets. I'm a passionate pet owner with a drive to help others like me uncover the truth about the pet industry and what goes on behind the scenes. Hello and welcome to Theory of Pets. My name is Samantha Randall and this is my first ever podcast. I'm so thrilled to have you guys here and I am doing this podcast so that I can share the information that I've gathered over the years being a pet owner. Um, We have lots of pets in our home right now. We have three dogs, three cats, and two rabbits. We have had everything from hamsters to livestock over the years. So I am excited to share. I'm going to start out talking about dogs and sharing a lot of the things that I know about dogs because that's the animal that I've had the most experience with and they are the ones that I know the most about. I have spent the last few years working with pets, writing about pets, researching and teaching other people about um, dogs specifically. So I'm excited to start this podcast and share all of my knowledge with you guys. Um, I'm also doing this podcast to bring the most accurate information to other dog owners and pet owners to test different products and see what works. I'm going to go through some trial and error phases and kind of do all the legwork so that you guys don't have to. I'll be researching. I'll be speaking with experts in the pet industry and trying to learn as much as I can so that I can share that information with you guys and you won't have to do all of the work that I have to do. Um, So basically the purpose of this podcast is just to help others to make sure that we're all taking the best care of our dogs that we possibly can. We all love our pets. They're like furry family members. I call our animals our fur babies. Um, We enjoy, I, I can't even put into words the joy that pets bring into our lives. And I know there are so many of you out there that feel the same way. And of course, we want to give them the best care that we possibly can, whether that's a proper diet, proper veterinary care, grooming, exercise. There's so many aspects of pet care that a lot of us don't think about on a day-to-day basis. We know that there are things that we need to do to care for our pets every day, but it's kind of like going through the motions. You do the same grooming, you feed them the same diet, you do the same exercise regimen. And what we've learned from research recently is that there may be better diets, better exercise, and that our dogs are just as in tune with the world around them as we are. And they don't like to do the same things day after day. They don't like eating the same meal day after day. So if we can change things up a little bit for them and give them the best care possible, that's my goal with this podcast. And I'm hoping that you guys will reach out and share your information as well. Again, like I said, I'm going to be speaking with experts in the pet industry, um, other pet owners, different people who are involved in caring for animals every day. And I'm going to share that information with you guys as well. Um, So what I'm going to ask you first of all is that if you are listening to this, if you enjoy it, after you finish this podcast, just jump on iTunes and give us a review. Um, As I said, this is my first podcast. I'm going to continue releasing these weekly so that you guys can check them out. And the faster that I can grow this, the more reach that I'll have. So I'm hoping that you guys will help me in my quest to reach as many dog owners as possible. And the easiest way to do that is just to jump on iTunes and give me a review. Um, I'm also going to be working with pet experts and doing some interviews and Q&As and things like that. And the bigger that my podcast can grow, the more reach I will be able to have with experts in the field. So if you could just jump on, do a quick review, that will help me immensely. And I would greatly appreciate that. So for my first podcast today, I wanted to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart. A lot of times when you're doing anything um, in the entertainment or the art industry, um, whether you are painting, whether you're acting, whether you're writing, whether you're doing a podcast, anything that you're putting out there for other people, people to say that you should do what you know best. So of course, one, I got started doing dogs. As I said, I've been a pet owner Um, and a dog owner my whole life, and a pet owner for most of my life. We've had cats and other animals. Um, So I obviously wanted to get involved with that as far as my career. And now for the last few years, I've been writing and doing videos and that kind of stuff. And now I'm ready to jump into my very first podcast. And I 
again, I want to start off with dogs. Um, and I will explore more as my podcast goes along. But for right now, we're going to stick with dogs. And the one thing that I know best about dogs is rescuing. That's what I've always tried to do for many, many years. We've taken rescue dogs into our home. Uh, as a child, my family always took in rescue dogs. And that's always been a passion of mine. It's always been something that I've been passionate about speaking with other people and educating other pet parents about as well. And along with rescuing comes the topic of irresponsible breeding. And as much as I like to advocate for people to rescue animals, I like to take it one step further and educate people and advocate for um, us to band together as a community and as a society to try to do whatever we can to get rid of irresponsible breeding. Irresponsible breeding is the reason that we need to rescue so many animals. It's the reason that so many animals are taken from places like puppy mills. And it's the reason that there are shelters filled with animals all over the world. So irresponsible breeding is a topic that I feel very, very passionately about. It's something that I spend a lot of time talking about, educating people about. It's something that I spend a lot of time researching. Um, There's always information in the news. All you have to do is do a quick Google search and you'll find the latest puppy mill in the news that they've taken puppies out of a puppy mill or um, one of the big things lately in the news has been the meat markets Um, over in other countries. Obviously, that's not legal here, um, but they're breeding these dogs for meat and that kind of stuff. So um, irresponsible breeding is an issue that affects breeders as well as potential pet parents. Um, It particularly hits close to my heart because we have rescued many dogs. Many of them have had complications due to irresponsible breeding. Currently right now we have a boxer named Chloe and um, I'm going to try and explain Chloe's story as best I can in as few words as I can because Chloe really has a strong history and it's all related to irresponsible breeding. It all comes back around to the improper breeding that was taking place for Chloe to come into this world. And so I guess I'll start when we adopted Chloe. Chloe was dumped on the side of the road. She was rescued by a good Samaritan who brought her to a local veterinary office, which happens to be the vet office that I bring my dogs to. Boxers are my breed of choice. Uh, We do have a lab and a beagle right now, but we've had boxers for many, many years, and I've rescued many boxers. Whenever I rescue a dog, I always bring them to my vet. That's our first stop on the way home. They get checked out, and just to make sure, if you get a dog from a rescue or a shelter organization, odds are they've already had a once-over from a vet, but I like to just have my personal vet look them over. Sometimes they see something that another expert has missed. Sometimes they just get a feel for the dog, the dog's personality, um, and they may be able to see some of those issues that were brought to my attention from the rescue or from the shelter. I can bring that to the attention of my vet, and then they'll have that background moving forward caring for my dog. So that's always our first stop, and um, obviously our vet, we've had now the same vet for uh, over a decade. She knows that we rescue boxers. They had this boxer, Chloe, Um, She didn't have a name at the time, but they had this boxer brought in. She was covered in frostbite. She was suffering pretty severely from malnutrition. She hadn't eaten or hadn't eaten anything that gave her the nutrition that she needed for a very long time. And the person that brought her in, they already had three dogs and they could not keep Chloe. Now, some people say, I can't believe it. You would pick up this dog and you wouldn't keep it. But that was actually a very responsible thing for that person to step up and say, I want to rescue this dog. I want to help this dog. But personally, we can't afford to take care of it. Had they tried to take on Chloe's burden themselves, she probably would have ended up in a shelter a little ways down the road anyway, because that family wouldn't have been a able to afford her and some of their other dogs may have been affected by that as well so it was a responsible thing for them to do Um, they had asked the vet clinic if they would look at her um, and if they should leave her at the vets or if they should take her to the shelter our veterinary office said please leave her here she needs immediate care and she needs a lot of immediate care we will take her we will do the work and we will then try and find her a home so they left her with the vet after about a week they gave chloe lots of fluids they got her eating um some raw food and they got some of her frostbite cared for but she still had a long road to recovery she was ready for a foster home though 
And I got a phone call from our veterinary from our veterinarian. She said, I know that you've rescued many boxers. We happen to have had a boxer put down about three months before that. Um, she had leukemia and um so we lost her and, you know, our vet said, we know you lost one a few months back. If you're, if you haven't found another one, if you're looking for another one, we have this girl here. She's very sweet. Um, you know, we know you'd give her a good home and, and that's what we're looking for. And even if you could just foster her for a short time until we found her home, that would be very beneficial. So we had another boxer at the time. We brought that boxer who was also a female, Maddie. We brought Maddie over to visit Chloe and they got along very well. So we took Chloe into our home. A very long story short, uh, she needed a lot of care immediately. She needed a lot of baths. She needed special creams to get her skin back to where it needed to be. She needed some special nutrition to get back on track nutritionally where she needed to be. Chloe had been bred. Uh, our vet estimated that she was somewhere between two and three years old. And we had Chloe fixed because she wasn't uh, spayed when we got her. When our vet opened her up, she could tell from the scarring on her uterus that she had had either three or four litters of puppies already. So um, at two years old, that's just unheard of. Most dogs aren't bred at all by the time that they hit two years old. So the fact that she had been bred that many times already means that she had been bred in every heat that she had had in her life so far. And that's very unhealthy for the dog. It stunted Chloe's growth. Um, and some of her health issues may be because of that. So we had Chloe spayed and we thought we were kind of in the clear. We were moving on. We were treating her skin and we were doing the things that we needed to do to get her back on track nutritionally. Um, about a year after I, Oh, no, sorry, about six months after I adopted Chloe, um, she had an episode after um, I was working at home that day, and, and after work, I went upstairs, and I couldn't find Chloe. She was in our room, and she was laying. She was having a hard time breathing, and um, she, there was a lot of issues going on. I could tell something wasn't right with her. We took her into the emergency vet, and after a five-day stay at the emergency vet clinic in our area... Uh, it was determined that Chloe had cardiomyopathy, which is a congenital disease, which means the dog's born with a disease, and it's an adult onset disease. So the dog is born with the disease, but they don't start showing symptoms until they're an adult. Typically, the average age for boxers to show signs of cardiomyopathy would be about the age of nine. Chloe was, as I mentioned, maybe three at the time. Um, so this was very early onset, and they they... Um, again, our vet is absolutely amazing. We can't speak highly enough about her and the team at our local emergency vet is absolutely amazing. They all worked together. They contacted a canine cardiologist. I live in Maine and there isn't one in our state. So they contacted one in the next state over in New Hampshire, just across the border, spoke with, um, that cardiologist and they worked with Chloe for five, five days to get her medications correct. She now takes two medications. Um, one she takes twice a day, one she takes three times a day. So that's five pills a day to regulate her heartbeat. And now bringing this all back and tying it in, now that you know Chloe's a little bit about Chloe and a little bit about her history, Chloe was born with this disease. This is an issue that should have been tested for before the Chloe's mother was bred, but it wasn't. Obviously it was passed on to the puppies in Chloe's litter. Um, our vet and the cardiologist and the, the team that works with Chloe believe that this was either a puppy mill type organization or just a very irresponsible backyard breeder who bred multiple generations of dogs with cardiomyopathy. Whether they had the original dog tested and knew about it and did it anyway or they just didn't do the proper testing that they should have generations ago, maybe Chloe's great, great grandmother had it, passed it down to her great-grandmother, passed it down to the grandmother, passed it down to the mother. Now it's passed down to Chloe. And because it runs so thick in her genetics, for some reason, Chloe's symptoms showed up very early. It didn't wait until she was eight or nine years old. They showed up when she was three. So the team that worked with Chloe believed that because of these symptoms showing up so early, it was a sign that 
you know, this ran very heavy in Chloe's genetics. And that means that there are generations of dogs out there somewhere, generations of boxers from Chloe's family who have this disease. Most of them probably didn't survive. Uh, A lot of people... The cardiologist that we spoke with said that many, many times, often when a dog's diagnosed with this, because it's such an expensive disease to diagnose and it's such an expensive disease to treat, we pay about $120 a month for Chloe's prescriptions. Um, That's not something that every family can afford. So oftentimes, if a family can't afford it, they have the dog put down. So if you think about that, think of all the generations in Chloe's lineage that have either lived a shorter lifespan or been put down because of this disease. And all of that leads back to irresponsible breeding. So Chloe is, I would say, in my family, this is our worst case scenario um, of health issues that have been that have come about in a dog because of irresponsible breeding. We've had others. A lot of times they're more mild, um, some hip issues and things like that. But in this case with Chloe, it was very severe. We're we're very thankful every day that she's still here with us, and we don't take any days with her for granted because we know that her life is going to be cut very short because of this. So, again, this is something that hits very near and dear to my heart. It's something that as pet owners we need to be aware of it's something that breeders obviously need to be aware of if you are a breeder and you're listening right now work with a qualified organization like the american kennel club or the american dog breeders association get those screenings for the parents of the puppies that you're going to be breeding now these can be all different tests if you're a breeder you probably already know about them there's eye tests and hip tests and things like that Um, again to test for genetic diseases and um, congenital diseases like Chloe had. So if you're a breeder, you need to take this very, very seriously. However, if you're a breeder, you already know about this. You know about the risks. And I highly encourage you, like I said, to do the right thing, to work with an organization that can help you through the steps of proper breeding, to do your research before you decide to become a breeder. But this podcast particularly is going to focus on if you're a potential pet parent and the reason that I like to educate people about this and speak about this is because so many times people want to adopt a dog from a puppy mill people want to adopt a dog from a backyard breeder who isn't the most responsible breeder because they feel bad for the puppies their goal is to get a puppy out of this environment out of this situation and they think if I adopt this puppy it's not going to have to live in this environment any longer so they think that they're doing a good thing and logically that does make sense and I see how one could think about that but if you flip it around and look at it from the other side as we all know there are two sides to every story so if you look at it from the other side what you're doing is For example, if I had gotten Chloe as a puppy, I paid this breeder for this dog. I bring Chloe home. I've now given this breeder five, six, eight hundred, a thousand dollars, whatever it might be. I've paid for this puppy. I've given the breeder the money. And now this breeder is going to use that money to turn around and continue to be an irresponsible breeder, to buy more adult dogs, to maybe you know, bring more dogs into their environment, adopt another dog into their home to be bred. You're providing them with money to give these puppies food, to feed the parents, that kind of stuff. And you might think, you know, I'm giving them money so that they can take care of the dogs that they're going to have anyway. Actually, if you don't adopt one of those puppies, there's actually something else that you can do to help save the puppies and the dogs in that person's care right now. And it's also something that you can do that's going to help future puppies that may come out of that establishment. And that is to leave the establishment and go and call your local animal control officer, your local ASPCA. These people will come in, they'll do an inspection, they'll see what's going on. And if these dogs are not being properly cared for, they're going to remove the dogs from the home. They'll remove the dogs the adult dogs and the puppies. So by not adopting a dog, you're not spending the money to continue to have this establishment continue business. And you're also going to be able to step away from the situation and call somebody that can help get these dogs into a better environment where they're going to be properly cared for. Now, does that mean that this breeder is not going to go out and start again? I can't tell you that. However, what I can tell you is that oftentimes – 
it's a large startup to buy these dogs, to buy the adult dogs to breed, and it's a startup cost to take care of the puppies at first before you can sell them and that kind of stuff. So if the dogs are removed, chances are the irresponsible breeder may not have the money to turn around and start a whole other business venture. So that's what you can do. It's something that's going to be beneficial to not just the puppy that you wanted to save, but it's going to be beneficial to all the dogs that have gone through that establishment and all the dogs that may go through that establishment in the future. So that's what I would recommend. If you find a breeder that you think is an irresponsible breeder, do not adopt a puppy thinking you're doing something good. Walk away, call the proper authorities, and they can help you with that. Now, the other downside to spending the money for this dog, again, I'll go back and use Chloe as an example. If I had adopted Chloe, if I had paid for her, I'm spending $500 on Chloe, I'm taking her home, and now three years down the road, we have all these issues that come up that we've seen with the cardiomyopathy and we're having all these heart tests done and we're buying these prescription pills and all of this stuff. Now, we spend over $100 a month. That's over $1,200 a year just on Chloe's medication. That's not including her food, her grooming needs, all of the supplies that we have to buy for her on top of that. That's $1,200 a year just on her medications. Now, we've already spent money to adopt the dog and maybe... Obviously, as a pet owner, when you adopt a puppy, you're not thinking you might have $1,000, $1,500 squirreled away somewhere in case your dog needs an emergency surgery or for when your dog needs to be spayed or neutered or that kind of stuff, which is the responsible thing to do. I highly encourage that. However, if you have $1,500 squirreled away, that's going to pay for Chloe's prescriptions for a year. That's not going to pay for any of her other vet care. Um... The bill that we got after her five-day stay at the emergency vet was almost $4,000. So if you had $1,500 saved, that's not even half of what you need for that one weekend stay at the emergency vet. So you're paying for the dog, and now further down the road, you don't have the money to care for the dog. What are What do your options then become? With a dog like Chloe, you don't have a lot of options because you can't turn this dog over to a shelter Now, you may find some type of a rescue organization that can take her in and can afford to pay for her care, but it's going to be very, very difficult to do that if you are able to. If you're not able to and you're not able to afford her care, the dog's going to be put down. So you've spent $500 on this dog. You've now loved and cared for this dog in your home for three years, and you're going to have to lose that dog because of improper breeding. So it's really a lose-lose on both ends you know if you if you pay for the dog you're helping the breeder continue to do something that is that should not be happening you're you are fostering that irresponsible breeding program you're also going to be paying for it in the long run because you're going to either lose your dog early or you're going to be paying much more money than you anticipated paying to care for this dog over the life over their entire life so if you're a potential pet parent you need to look for a reputable breeder because adopting a dog from an irresponsible breeder is just not going to work. No matter which way you look at it, it's a negative thing. So you want to look for a responsible breeder. I touched on a little bit when I was talking about breeders that may be listening to this podcast right now. You want to look for a breeder that's had those proper testings done and you don't want to just take someone's word for it. There needs to be documentation of this. There's going to be testing done in the eyes, testing done on the hips, genetic testing done for the diseases that um, are passed genetically and you want proof of that. You want to see the written proof of that. You should also be allowed to tour the facility. If you call a breeder and you say, I'm looking to adopt one of your puppies. I saw your ad online. I saw your ad in the paper, whatever the case may be. I saw your sign out by the road. I want to come in. I want to check out these puppies. If there's any kind of excuses, if they give you the runaround to try and delay that or anything like that, a responsible breeder is going to welcome you in. Absolutely. Come on in. Come see the dogs. Come see the adults. Come see the mother and the father. Come see the establishment that we work from. Because at the end of the day, a responsible breeder is going to be just as curious about you as you are going to be about them. You want to know that they're an upstanding breeder, that they're doing what they need to do to properly care for their dog. And on the flip side, they want the same thing from you. They want to know that the person that's taking one of their puppies is an upstanding pet owner, is going to be somebody that's going to give this dog the love, the nurturing, and the caring that it needs for the rest of its life. So that's going to mean that they want to see 
how you interact with the dog. They want to know about your history. Do you work from home? Do you work out of the home? How many hours a day are you gone? Is the puppy going to be alone all the time? Do you have kids? Do you bring the dog traveling with you, hiking, things like that? What are you looking for? Now, the breeder is going to do this for a number of reasons. The first one being that they, of course, want their dog to go to a family that's going to love them and care for them. The second being that they also want to make sure that the breed that they have is going to be a fit for your family. And you want to do the same thing. A breeder should talk to you about what you're looking for in a dog. Now, for example, we have a Labrador Retriever. Labs are very high energy. They have a lot of energy. They love to run. They love to be busy. Labs can, they're prone to being overweight because they love to eat. So they need to be in a home where they're getting a lot of exercise. They're getting a lot of activity. Labs love to be outdoors. They love to be in the water. So if you went to a breeder who bred Labradors and you said, geez, you know, I'm gone a lot. I work 12 hours a day and then I commute, you know, an hour or two. So I'm gone for about 13 hours a day. I live by myself. I don't have any kids. And, you know, a lot of times on the weekends I'm running errands and I go to lunch with my girlfriends and I'm doing things and the dog's in the kennel sometimes on the weekend or the dog's alone on the weekend or whatever the case may be, they're probably going to encourage you to look into another breed of dog. And actually, if your life is that busy, you probably wouldn't be ready for a dog anyway. But you know, you understand what I'm saying. If you have an, a lifestyle that a dog's not going to fit in, the breeder may tell you just that, geez, you know, these dogs are really high energy. They love their family dog. They love to be around kids. They love to be active. They love to be outdoors. And you just don't have that type of lifestyle. If you lived in an apartment, for example, a Labrador breeder may say, geez, you know, you live in a little one bedroom apartment. You can take your dog for two walks a day. That really isn't enough for a lab. Maybe you should look for a smaller breed or a breed that's going to be better suited for apartment life. So the breeder wants to know as much about you as you want to know about them, and they should be very welcoming and very open of that. They should absolutely let you tour the facility anytime, no excuses. I mean, of course, if if the facility's closed, if somebody's gone away for the day or whatever, but if they're giving you the runaround for two or three times in a row that, oh, well, I can't do it today, and I, I don't really know, I'll have to call you back with a better time and that kind of stuff – you want to stay away from that. You you really don't want to go anywhere that does not welcome you in with open arms. They should also, when you go into the facility, you should be able to see most of the time you can see both parents. Traditionally, even if a breeder studs a dog, if they have the female and they stud out for the male, um, they will either have the male visiting there so that you can meet the dog or they'll have a history on the father so that you can uh, know about that. They should have some pictures, maybe some videos, and uh, definitely the history on the father. Now, the mother, of course, should be on site taking care of the puppies. That's something you want to make sure happens and you should be able to interact with the adult dogs as well Um, and you want to see the histories for both parents the the breeder again whether they have both dogs on site or not should have a very detailed history for both of the parents Um, they should also be working with a vet that's where that history should come from they should be working with a vet that knows the history of the parents and has seen the pups multiple times if you're going in to get a dog and um, you know you can't adopt till they're eight weeks old but they go you go in to check out the puppies when they're six weeks old these dogs should be seen by a vet already um, two or three times in that six weeks they should have had certain shots already and they should be um, have been checked out by a veterinarian so you want to be aware of that ask who the vet is see if there's any documentation from that vet Um, and if you know if they don't have a lot of information give the vet a call or stop by the office and just say hey I'm interested in these puppies they'll give you five minutes of time to talk to you about what they know about the the pups and about the parents Also, one of the things you want to look for when you go to the facility is that there shouldn't be more than one breed of dog. If they're breeding Labradors and Boxers and Chihuahuas all at the same place, that may be a sign that there's some type of a puppy mill or a a very irresponsible breeding program going on. Um, Usually for a small facility, there should only be one breed Uh, Sorry, one litter at any time, one breed and one litter at any time. Sometimes bigger places, if they're a larger breeding facility, they may have um, eight or ten adult dogs and they may have more than one litter at a time. But you need to judge that based on the size of the facility. And when you go in and you tour, you know, you'll be able to see oftentimes if they have more than one litter at a time, they'll have somebody helping to come in and and help with those other dogs. You know, it's not just a a small little facility with two or three adults. They've got a lot of adult dogs and they may have more than one litter. But oftentimes, 
it's one litter at a time and certainly one breed at a time. Um, Responsible breeders usually pick a breed and they stick with that breed. So that's something to look for. Again, you know, if you find a dog that's in a situation where they're not being properly cared for, if you want to adopt a, a puppy and you can, some of these triggers you're noticing that maybe the breeder isn't as responsible as they need to be, do not try and help one of those puppies by adopting them. Step back. Call the animal control officer, call the local ASPCA, and do something to help all of those puppies and their parents. That is my advice for anybody. Um, If you have any comments, any questions, if you have a story to share, if you have a dog like Chloe, or if you're a breeder and you'd like to share some information that I haven't shared, please feel free to do that. Um, You can check out our website, which is theoryofpets.com. I should have mentioned that in the beginning as well. Um, You guys can check that website out anytime. Don't forget to leave me a review on iTunes. Um, I am trying to help as many dog owners as I can, as many reach as many potential pet owners as I can, um, and get this information out there to help educate people. So the faster that my podcast grows, I will be able to reach out to more pet parents and more potential pet parents. Um, As it grows, I'll also be able to reach out to um, bring in more qualified pet experts for interviews and question and answer sessions that will help the pet owners that I reach with my podcast. So um, I, I... highly, highly, highly encourage you to jump on iTunes and give me a quick review. It only takes a minute and it will be a huge help for my new podcast, Theory of Pets. On theoryofpets.com, you can also find my show notes and that'll have all the basic information here. Um, It's all listed there in bullets so you can see it nice and easily if you would like to send somebody else there or you would like to help me educate pet owners about the importance of responsible breeding. um, I would be happy to speak with you about that. Any questions or anything like that, again, jump on theoryofpets.com. You can find the show notes and if you still can't find the answers that you're looking for, there's a comment section. You can leave a comment or ask any questions. Um, There's also a place where you can record a question, and next week when I come back with my podcast for next week, any questions that um, stick out on there, any that are asked multiple times or anything like that, um, I'm going to choose a couple of those questions, and I'll answer those on the air next week. So if you record a question, you may be on next week's podcast, so give that a try as well. I hope you guys really enjoyed my first podcast. Again, I'm so thrilled to share Theory of a Pets with you, and I hope you guys tune in next week for my second podcast. I will see you guys next Sunday.